You're listening to The Drag. I'm Katie Pinchik Alka, and this is Forsaken. This episode is the second of a two part series about the murder of Stacey Stites and the man who was convicted and sentenced to death for her murder, Rodney Reed. So if you haven't listened to episode one, go back and listen, then come back for part two. In this episode, Aisling Ayers recounts Rodney Reed's trial for capital murder. May 4th, 1998 was a big day in Bastrop, Texas. More than two years had passed since the body of 19-year-old Stacy Stites was found among the wildflowers on Blue Bonnet Drive. And inside the walls of the historic courthouse, testimony officially began for the town's first capital murder trial in almost 50 years. The state of Texas versus Rodney Reed. (music) To recap from part one of this series, Rodney Reed was on trial for the murder of Stacey Stites. Rodney had admitted that he'd been having an affair with Stacey in the months leading up to her death. He was indicted on two counts of capital murder when sperm found inside Stacy's body positively matched with Rodney's DNA. Even though his sperm was found, Rodney maintained that he didn't murder Stacy. Then there's Stacy's fiance, Jimmy Fennell, who was a police officer in a nearby town. Police eliminated Jimmy as a suspect after several interrogations, despite past allegations of violence against him. In Texas, capital murder is punishable by the death penalty or life in prison. The trial would determine Rodney's fate. In a small back room of the historic county courthouse, a group of 12 people sat around a table. Paper covered the window, blocking the view of chanting protesters and TV camera crews outside. It's been 25 years since the trial. And one of the people in that room has never spoken to anyone about her experience. Until now. I looked over things to come here today just to remind me. And I looked over the pictures of her body and it still, it still shakes me up pretty badly. It's, it's, still pretty, it's still pretty fresh, even 25 years later. I found this woman almost by complete chance. I met her at an event last year, and when the group was making small talk, the topic of jury duty came up. She casually said that she doesn't have to worry about getting called for jury duty anymore, since she served on the jury of a major murder case in the late 90s. I asked her which case, and you can imagine my shock when she said Rodney Reed. Even though it was decades ago, she told me that it stayed with her, and she's a different person because of that trial. I told her about my ongoing work on this podcast. She wanted to talk to me, to talk about her experience. She asked me not to use her name or her age, but she agreed to an interview. Well, I, you know, it was definitely during the prime of my life, that I would say that. And I had actually um, moved to my family's ranch at that time. And so I was within the, you know, Bastrop County District there and got called for jury duty, which is, you know, every American's um, job to do when they're called, you know, to, to serve on that jury. And so I, um, you know, was part of the community. My family had had a ranch there for many, many, many years. So definitely was a part of that community and, um, you know, was really involved in some of the things around town and just had welcomed and kind of embraced that community. She wasn't thrilled about getting called for jury duty. She had a job in finance in Austin and she didn't want to miss work for that long. She usually commuted there from Bastrop every day. 
you know, I think when you get called for jury duty, like no one really wants to be called, I guess, would probably be a fair assessment. <laughs> but you, you know, you go show up and um, I think I I basically said, hey, this is my my duty. I have to go do this and 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 went to try to go fulfill that. But I definitely tried to get out of it, I would say. Um, didn't really want to serve on that jury. Um, so it was, you know, it was a definitely a hard thing to be called for. She told me that she didn't know much about the case when she got called for jury duty. I really didn't know much at, at that point. I did know that someone in our community had been murdered, um, obviously a young woman, and, um, you know, didn't really know much else, I guess, besides a headline, you know, or something that, you know, uh, just everyone would have heard. She had no way to know that the jury she'd end up serving on would eventually make headlines of their own for their decisions in that trial. I've never served on a jury before, but I've read enough studies and watched enough crime shows to know the basic responsibilities. But I didn't know how they were chosen. And in this trial, that group of 12 people held the weight of a man's life in their hands. So I reached out to someone who could explain the jury selection process in Texas to me. My name is Mary Rose, and I'm a professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I've been studying juries and um, jury selection, jury representativeness, jury decision making, capital cases, civil cases, kind of all things jury, at least American jury, um, since the mid-90s. In other words, Mary Rose is a jury expert. She's done an immense amount of research on the process as a whole and even on the science of decision making. Her work has even been cited by the Supreme Court. Mary told me that juries keep our government in check, and overall, she's a fan of the jury system. But it's not perfect. The founders thought a lot about a jury. And they saw the jury as a check, and so much so that one legal scholar has called them the fourth branch of government, because they are a check on every other branch. I asked her how someone is chosen for jury duty. Texas draws juries for state cases um, based on a combination of driver's license records and voter registration rolls. So um, if you're on one of those lists, you could be summoned. Um, They take a random sample and they send a jury summons. Remember, Rodney Reed was charged with capital murder. Mary told me they usually summon more people than they actually need for capital cases because there are a few more qualifications. Capital cases, unlike every other criminal justice, criminal case, require that somebody be willing to entertain giving a death sentence in order to serve on the jury at all. To serve on the jury for a capital murder case, you have to be what experts call, quote, death qualified. It doesn't mean you have to be a big supporter of the death penalty. In fact, they prefer it if you're not a big supporter of it. But you have to at least be open to it. Basically, they want jurors to be open to considering both life in prison and the death penalty. And this isn't just a Texas thing. It's a national rule that's consistent with the Constitution and several Supreme Court rulings. The death penalty is one of America's most divisive topics, but most Americans still lean in favor of it. In 2021, the Pew Research Center found that 60% of U.S. adults support the death penalty for people convicted of murder. The numbers are similar for Texans, with 63% supporting the death penalty, according to research conducted by the University of Texas in 2021. You're not entitled to a particular kind of juror on your case. Um, We talk a lot about jury of your peers. That's not a phrase. That's actually in the Constitution. It's a concept, but it doesn't mean you get people that are like you or believe like you or look like you. Mary told me that people who support the death penalty will naturally hold different opinions about certain topics than those who are against it. So think about all the ways that someone who supports a death penalty might also believe other things. They might be more likely to believe that 
police never lie on the stand. They might be more likely to believe that if someone is charged with a crime, they're probably guilty. They might be more likely to believe that um, that defendants who don't testify probably have something to hide. There's just a way in which your view about the death penalty is probably, not absolutely, but probably bound up in a lot of other beliefs about guilt, innocence, etc. Then you add in the fact that in this case, as in many cases, the, the, a case is more likely to be pursued as a death sentence, death penalty case, if it involves a black offender and a white victim. That's a finding that's been found for decades and has not been disturbed. We don't know exactly why that is. There's some fights in the criminological literature over over why that's the case. But those that particular combination, particularly black man and white woman, very likely to be pursued as a death sentence case, which means they're not pleading the person out. They're not, you know, willing to consider life without parole. They're pursuing it as a death penalty case. And so you have a very, given our history, a pretty fraught case brought before a group that has been selected because they believe in the death penalty or at least are willing to give a death penalty um, sentence. And those are the people that decide the guilt or innocence phase. So capital cases are unusual among jury cases. And those of us who study this wish the court would revisit and think again Mm -hmm. about that original, it's called Lockhart versus McCree, about that original ruling because the evidence is very clear that the jury that hears um, the guilt innocence phase is more likely to convict than a more representative jury would be. When the juror arrived at the courthouse for the first time in March of 1998, a little over a month before the trial would begin, she heard about the case and filled out a jury questionnaire. Then she was questioned by the two sets of attorneys and the judge. The lead prosecutor was an attorney named Lisa Tanner. She specialized in complex capital murder cases. On the side of the defense, the Reed family initially hired a private defense attorney named Jimmy Brown to represent Rodney. Brown and an investigator found some witnesses and made a lot of headway in the case. But eventually, the Reed family couldn't afford to pay Brown anymore. So the state appointed Lydia Clay Jackson and her co-counsel Calvin Garvey as the defense in October 1997. Clay Jackson would later testify that she didn't have enough time to prepare for the trial proceedings that began the following March. Both attorneys had the chance to question the jurors for potential bias. Tanner and Clay Jackson asked most of the questions to the prospective jurors, questions like what their opinions were on interracial dating, or if they used the N-word. And if someone was dismissed by the end, it was for cause, which means that there was a reason this person couldn't be fair in this case. The attorneys would then each handpick individuals that they didn't want on the jury. And they don't have to give a reason for these decisions. Here's Mary Rose again. In small towns, it's tough because everybody knows everybody. And you just have to be someone who's willing to set that aside and listen to the evidence with an open mind, even if you go to church with three of the people, you know, that you see in court, Uh, even if you grew up with the prosecutor, even if you know the police deputy very well. Like, you have to be willing to set that stuff aside. The 12 jurors were chosen. And on May 4th, the trial of the state of Texas versus Rodney Reed officially began. The trial was open to the public, so the courthouse was packed. On some particularly tense days, the jurors were escorted into the courthouse in the morning and then back out at the end of the day. The defense had tried to request the trial be moved to another county. They argued that Bastrop was a very white, homogenous community, and that might affect the outcome of the jury's decision but the request was denied. And that day, it felt as if the entire town was watching. In the room sat the family and friends of Stacy, the family and friends of Rodney, Jimmy Fennell, and Rodney himself. Here's the juror again. 
seeing Stacy's family so upset and weeping and, you know, just the grief and having to relive all of this, I can't imagine, you know, having to sit there and, and relive what had happened to their child. And then, of course, also seeing, you know, Rodney's family and, you know, thinking, wow, this, you know, this is serious. My son has been accused of this. And, you know, this is, you know, I can't imagine what that would feel like as well to to think, you know, this this is going to greatly affect my family. And so seeing those two groups, you know, sitting there in front of you, um, it, it was it was heavy. It was really, really, you know, serious and somber. There was and still is a lot of controversy surrounding the work of Rodney's defense lawyers. They were appointed by the state. And concerns about the work of state-hired attorneys are extremely common. Like I said earlier, they hadn't had much time to catch up on Rodney's case when they joined his defense. Here's Jordan Smith, the reporter for The Intercept that you heard from last episode. She's the one who has covered Rodney's case since the early 2000s. I think it wasn't until like, I think it was like a week, until like a week before trial, they'd spent no more than 40 hours on the case, which is just crazy. This is a death penalty case, and you basically spend the equivalent of a work week on it. I mean, imagine that. Across the country, defendants who can't afford private attorneys often receive the short end of the stick. This isn't even always the fault of the attorneys hired to represent them. Most of the time, they're overworked and underpaid by the state. But because people of color are arrested and convicted at disproportionately higher rates, they're often the ones ending up with these court-appointed attorneys. Rodney's defense had to prove his innocence. And this hinged upon proving his alleged affair with Stacy. In the months leading up to the trial, people began stepping forward, wanting to speak out about what they knew about Rodney and Stacy's affair. And going into the trial, the defense attorneys had gathered 10 witnesses who had signed affidavits and agreed to testify. It was a mix of Stacy's HEB co-workers, friends and family members of Rodney, and other community members. Just based on this group alone, It was clear that a good number of people in this small town knew about the couple, or had at least seen them together. But the defense called very few witnesses to actually testify about the affair on Rodney's behalf, and none of them did a very good job. Here's Jordan again. They had a couple witnesses who made some sort of missteps on the the witness stand one who said she was aware of this affair called Stacy Stephanie on the stand, which wasn't great for the credibility of the story though, um, you know. Um, And then there were people that they just didn't call. There were a bunch of people they didn't call. At the back of the room, Rodney's cousin, Chris Aldridge stood waiting. He was ready to testify about Rodney's alibi for those late night and early morning hours that the murder happened. He said he was with Rodney at the community center until 3 or 4 a.m. and that they walked to work together a couple of hours later. Chris also signed an affidavit describing an interaction that the pair had with Jimmy when Jimmy threatened that he knew about Rodney and Stacy. You know, there was also, at the time, um, there was indication that Jimmy Fennell knew that Stites was having a relationship with Rodney. There were people, uh, of course, connected to the Reed family, which is why they were discounted, or that somehow knew Reeds in, the Reeds in, in some way or form, um, that Jimmy had basically you know, approached Rodney and said he knew and that Rodney was gonna somehow pay for this. Um, there was a guy who Rodney uh, told that, like right after it happened. He, you know, said that he was told that right after it happened. And this is all, remember, before Stacy dies. Chris waited to be called to the stand, but the defense never called him, and he never spoke in court. I asked the juror how she felt about Rodney's defense, and I want to ask of when you at the time were on that trial, mm-hmm. do you feel? 
and I guess you kind of just answer this, you you felt like the defense's argument was not as strong. I felt like, you know, obviously they have, you know, equal time to present their case. And I don't think they really had a lot to say. I don't think they really had a lot of rebuttal. Um, they couldn't find a single person that could attest to this secret relationship that Stacy and Rodney had been having, the secret love affair that literally no one, no one, I mean, you would think that, that the defense could find someone that had that had knowledge of this secret affair. Anyone. The defense didn't have a lot of, of evidence that he was not the killer. Clay Jackson later said that she and Garvey worried that bringing up some of Rodney's witnesses would hurt him rather than help him. Several of them had criminal records of their own, and she said that she didn't want the jury to associate Rodney with crime. According to one of the stories that Jordan Smith wrote for the Austin Chronicle, Clay Jackson said one of the witnesses they did call to the stand was threatened by local law enforcement. The witness was a woman who owned a local bar, and Clay Jackson said she was picked up for a DWI almost immediately after she left the courthouse. But according to Jordan's story, the defense never told the judge about these incidents and it wasn't addressed in court. It's worth noting that the climate of Bastrop was tense, to say the least. In 2006, the investigative documentary titled State vs. Reed premiered to the public. Filmmaker Ryan Polomsky told me that he also interviewed several potential witnesses who said they were threatened at the time of the trial. There was a lot at stake, and it's fair to say that local law enforcement had a motive to protect one of their own. The big thing with Rodney's case is people didn't want to talk about it, right? Because they were afraid they're in this small community. Uh, they don't feel you know, you know, necessarily safe. Uh, it was, it's not a safe environment down there. It was not a safe environment down there. After they tried to present the argument for the affair between Rodney and Stacy, the defense presented a few theories about how someone other than Rodney could have killed Stacy. Namely, Stacy's fiance, Jimmy. And to combat these accusations of Jimmy's guilt, Prosecutor Lisa Tanner called him to the stand to testify. The Austin American Statesman newspaper wrote that Jimmy was dressed in a dark suit as he testified. He spoke about how great his relationship was with Stacy. He wept on the stand. And according to the juror, it seemed like he was genuinely grieving. You know, I don't really feel like necessarily Jimmy Fennell's you know, family or, you know, had um, anything to be overly, you know, concerned about as far as their own son. But of course, that their soon-to-be daughter-in-law was dead. You know, that was, I think all of them were, were grieving and were, you know, um, definitely in a state of shock and um, anger and sadness and you know yes you could see it all you could see it all there you know you could definitely um, feel the tension and see the different parties and their reactions to the information that was presented the claim that jimmy and stacy had a dysfunctional relationship and were regularly arguing was never brought up in court even though one of Stacy's friends told investigators about Jimmy's violent temper a couple months before the trial. Jimmy's previous record of stalking was also never mentioned. Here's Jordan Smith again. And none of that came out. I mean, the state point, you know, sort of painted Jimmy as this very stoic, uh, you know, good cop, uh, family man, devoted to Stites with this perfect relationship. Even when, you know, Law enforcement knew that there was not, that was not exactly an accurate um, sort of picture. Like you heard in part one of this series, the main reason Texas Ranger Rocky Wardlow stopped looking at Jimmy as a suspect is because his truck ended up in the Bastrop High School parking lot, but he woke up at his apartment in Giddings, 
a 30-minute drive away. The prosecution brought this up again at the trial. Tanner asked the courtroom how Jimmy could have dumped the body and then made it all the way back to his apartment without a truck. And when it was Rocky Wardlow's turn to testify, he said that the Rangers couldn't find a way Jimmy could have logistically committed the crime. That's also when he clarified that he checked with taxi companies and even looked at the mileage on patrol cars in Giddings, in case Jimmy might have driven one of them back home instead. But Jimmy didn't have an alibi. Rocky wrote in his investigative report that he interviewed two people about Jimmy's whereabouts that night. First, Jimmy's good friend, David Hall, who was also a police officer. David would later change his story and admit that he dropped Jimmy off at his apartment after a night of drinking after the Little League game. The other person Rocky interviewed was Jimmy's neighbor, but at the time, neither one of them said they saw Jimmy that night. At the trial, a DPS investigator who processed the crime scene testified that Stacy had been raped and strangled. Then the prosecution walked the jury through their timeline to explain how that happened. It was a sequence of events built entirely upon Jimmy's word. I asked the juror what parts of the trial really convinced her. What made her lean in a certain direction? She told me that based on all the evidence that the prosecution presented, it was hard to believe that anything else could have happened that night. The path was so clear. It was so clear cut. Um, you know, this, you know, obviously, you know, they presented that, you know, Rodney Reed had stalked her, basically, which is how they were seen together at the grocery store because, you know, he'd go to the produce section or wherever she was stocking things and talk to her, you know, as, as stalkers do, right? I mean, it's one of the things that serial stalkers you know, rapists, murderers do is probably track their, their prey and learn their, you know, where they're headed and what they're doing and about them and what their schedule is. And, and so then, you know, as she pulled up on her way to work to this same intersection that she goes through every shift, you know, there he was and, you know, opened her passenger door or basically ripped her out, you know, through the, with her seatbelt still buckled, you know. And so as each, each item of this adventure of this particular heinous day unfolded, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of questions. There wasn't a lot of question in your mind. Um, it, it, it was so cut and dry. It, it, was hard, it was hard to really believe that anything else could possibly have happened. The prosecution argued that the initial struggle happened inside of the truck based on its condition and all of the physical evidence that was left there, and the seatbelt marks across Stacy's shoulder. When Rodney allegedly apprehended Stacy near the railroad tracks, the prosecution argued that he was on foot. After all, Bastrop locals had noticed Rodney walking on foot from place to place around town before. He roamed the streets at night. This was his route. But Julie Strickland, Rodney's longtime friend, told me that Rodney had always walked from place to place. It was just what he did. Sure. I mean, he would walk from his house to the store down the street to use the payphone or to play the pool table. And I think it's funny that, that that's like such a weird thing. Like somebody's walking around the town. So what? You know what I mean? Who, who cares? Finally, it was time for the smoking gun of the trial. The DNA. The sperm found in Stacy's body matched with a DNA sample from Rodney. It was the only piece of physical evidence that tied Rodney to Stacy. And both sides had a different argument. The defense argued that the sperm found in Stacy's body could be explained by Rodney's story that he and Stacy had had sex in the state park a few nights before her murder. But the prosecution explained the presence of the sperm by arguing that Stacy was assaulted. The medical examiner, Robert Bayardo, then took to the front of the room to give his testimony to the jury. 
He presented all of his medical conclusions to the court and explained that Stacy's cause of death was asphyxiation when she was strangled with her belt. He said she was both raped and sodomized. And Bayardo told the jury that the three sperm cells that were found in Stacy had been deposited at the time of the murder, or right before it. This was the conclusion that the prosecution leaned heavily upon. They said that according to this timeline that the DNA created, Stacy couldn't have been assaulted and murdered until after she left her apartment. Like I talked about in the last episode, this wasn't the only conclusion that could have been drawn from this piece of DNA. Remember, in the decades since this trial, we've learned that sperm can live in the body for up to five days after sex. And our DNA expert, Chase Baumgartner, said that the presence of DNA alone can't prove whether the sex act was consensual or not. That you're, you're making that leap between the semen stains means that he's the murderer instead of that there's a sexual relationship. And so that's a pitfall, right? You're making um, this logical leap of, uh, we know whose DNA it is, so now, therefore we know who killed her. And DNA can't tell you that. But the defense didn't call any form of expert medical testimony of their own. Even though questions and concerns would come up later about if Bayardo's conclusions were really valid. When he was questioned by the defense, Bayardo actually admitted that when looking at the medical evidence on Stacy's body alone, the sexual activity that occurred could have been consensual. But without any witnesses to really prove the defense's case, the juror said she took the side of the prosecution. After all, Bayardo was the medical expert, and his scientific opinion was that there was an assault. You know, if you want to say the smoking gun of, of the DNA, you know, I mean, that seemed like the, the slam dunk, you know, at the time. I mean, unfortunately, it's, this, is, this is scientific evidence that can't be disputed. And without a single witness saying they were having a secret relationship, you know, the jury had no choice but to, to draw that conclusion. You know, that, that was the evidence presented to us. And I don't know how your semen gets in you know, someone's body otherwise if, if there isn't a secret relationship. It had to be by force. But the scientific evidence was disputed. And 14 years later, in 2012, both Bayardo and the Texas Department of Public Safety actually recanted their conclusions and testimonies about the sperm DNA. But the court said it was too late. The medical evidence on Stacy's body brought up a lot of controversy in the court. Bayardo went on to argue that there was evidence of anal rape. There were images of five unexplained burns, including a cigarette burn, on her body. Some of these burns and bruises weren't visible in any of the crime scene footage. And medical experts now argue that these are post-mortem injuries that could prove the body was mishandled after its discovery. The prosecution showed a lot of crime scene photographs of Stacy's body to the jury. And the juror said that this was the hardest part for her. You know, we had to really get into all the forensics in order to fully understand the timeline, in order to fully understand um, what had happened, in order to understand all the scientific processes. That, that was a very large part of the trial. And so I think picture after picture and description after description, one of the things that stood out to me is just feeling sick the whole time. I mean, not only at the gravity of you know, what had happened or the gruesomeness of the nature of the crime, but, you know, these were things that I had never thought I would be listening to and viewing on a screen, you know, um, <laughs> various body parts and, you know, descriptions of, of things that had happened to this horrendously decomposed, you know, decomposing body, uh, badly beaten and raped and, you know, strangled. It's, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. And um, I had often had to ask to be excused. When the trial proceedings were over for the day, each member of the jury was allowed to return home. 
But the jurors said that not being able to tell anyone about what had happened that day made it even harder. Strict instructions not to speak to anyone, you know, not to share any information. After two weeks of testimony, it was time for the jury to make their decision. The only information that they had were the arguments and the evidence presented to them in that courtroom, and the narrative that each side chose to tell. They spent six hours in deliberation before they presented their verdict. I think that um, we were crazy thorough. We took our time. We brought, you know, when we were even deliberating, because obviously, you know, we didn't discuss it a lot except for during the deliberation time. So we had the transcript brought in. We read over everything from the trial, you know. We had all the evidence brought in. We looked through all of the evidence. We discussed ad nauseum as a group. We would call for them to bring us something or, you know, we wanted to read this over again or whatever. We really only, you know, we didn't have anyone that was a holdout. We really just had a very, very thorough you know, one or two people that were like, I really need to go over this again. I really need to hear this again. I really need to, you know, let's talk about this again. And other than that, the evidence was so overwhelming of his guilt that there wasn't a lot to discuss beyond just making sure that we had it right. Just making sure that we had not left any stone unturned and that there wasn't any reasonable doubt at all. And and that's what we spent time discussing as as a group. The foreman read it out. Guilty. Just to see everyone's reaction and to know that, hey, you're you're responsible for that. You know, we felt the magnitude, you know, of our decision. Um, And, you know, as... We had been getting reactions from the courtroom the whole time, you know, just, um, I had people staring me down, grimacing, making gestures, intimidating gestures towards me, um, you know, some people would just stare at me and never look away, like, trying to make eye contact with me, with the, you know, just glaring at me, you know, and so you definitely felt the weight of all that time kind of crash, crash down, (laughs) at that moment. But after the jury filed out, the courtroom was silent, except for the sounds of crying. Stacy's family cried out with relief, while Rodney's family sobbed in agony, convinced that the jury had convicted the wrong man. So do you feel like you made that decision being like, I am, and maybe still, do you feel like you made that decision with confidence and without a reasonable doubt? Absolutely. A hundred percent. One hundred percent. Rodney's sentencing took place 10 days after his guilty verdict. And the same jury that ruled him guilty would decide whether he'd spend life in prison or face the death penalty. This is where Rodney's past really mattered in deciding his fate. The jury now had to consider whether Rodney's entire character, not just his guilt of the crime, deserved the death penalty. It is basically a free-for-all. Like, anything you ever have even been alleged to have done wrong can come in. And it doesn't have to have proof, right? It can be a mere allegation against you. What Jordan's talking about here is exactly what happened in Rodney's punishment hearing. The juror watched as the prosecutors called up victims of previous alleged assault and sexual assault. What unfolded before us was shocking, literally shocking. One after the other. The jury heard the stories of three different alleged victims. And at the punishment hearing, they, the, the, the prosecutors just brought up every 
you know, unadjudicated uh, claim they could possibly think of to cast Rodney as a predator. Um, and, you know, and particularly as a predator uh, of white women, um, you know, it just sort of dusting off the classic racist trope of predator black men preying on white women. I mean, they deployed that skillfully. As she listened to story after story and was shown more graphic images of the victim's injuries, the juror felt differently. You felt a wave of relief that you had made the right decision. You felt like, okay, this is a terrible, terrible person. One of the victims claimed she was assaulted in Wichita Falls, where Rodney lived before moving to Bastrop. Rodney said the sex was consensual, but that he hit her when she insulted him after sex. His DNA was matched to the sperm found inside of her. But in 1991, he was acquitted. The woman still took the stand in Rodney's punishment trial. Another story was about a 12-year-old. She had allegedly been attacked raped, and sodomized while she was sleeping in her Bastrop home in 1989. At the trial, photographs of bite marks on the victim's face were shown to the jury. Rodney was charged with this rape, but he never went to trial for it. Then another Bastrop woman took the stand. She said she was attacked and raped by the railroad tracks after a night of drinking in 1995. In May 1997, the semen found in her body matched Rodney's DNA. Jordan told me she felt like these women never received actual justice because law enforcement never fully investigated their cases. She said the last two cases were never fully pursued because Rodney was already on trial for Stacy's murder, but that they were still used against him at the trial. I mean, if you read the details of their cases, um, you realize that, that it doesn't, it was very, they're all very different and it was all very convenient to be able to wrap them up in a bow in a punishment phase where they can just make an allegation. The juror told me that the jury didn't know about any of Rodney's past accused crimes during the first portion of the trial. But afterwards, she felt like it justified the guilty verdict that they made. And I felt like I had stopped evil in its tracks, that I had literally saved our community from further heartache and from further violence and heinous crimes. And it, it was equally terrifying and horrible and sad and awful and relieving at the same time. This is the part that I think, you know, made me uh, fearful and and look over my shoulder, probably, uh, to this day. Um, Just the fact that there is such evil in the world. Um, And having to live through that, I mean, it's different to watch it on TV or see a show, but but when you have the witness in front of you um, telling you that, I mean, they, I can't believe that they lived. I can't believe they made it out of that. You know, you, you are equally... Uh, so happy for them and relieved and, and horrified at the same time that they had to go through that. She felt like there was only one punishment that really brought true justice. In the end, I mean, I felt like the consensus was that if there ever was a call for the death penalty, it was now. The Austin American statesman wrote that the jurors were asked two questions as they decided on their verdict. First, would Rodney Reed pose a threat to society in the future? They answered yes. Next, were there any circumstances that would spare the executioner's needle? They answered no. And on May 29th, 1998, After four hours of deliberating, the jury made a unanimous decision. Rodney Reed should die by lethal injection at the hands of the state. 
Rodney was transported to the Allen B. Polunsky Unit in Livingston, Texas, a small town on the edge of the East Texas Piney Woods, almost a three-hour drive from Bastrop. In the days and weeks after the trial, many headlines about Rodney's death sentence would focus on the all-white jury that convicted him. Here's the jury expert, Mary Rose, again. If you were to go to Wikipedia, all-white jury has its own page. It's such a powerful symbolism and negative symbol in this country. And it has a very ugly history because, particularly in the South, that's all that got seated and they made decisions in particular ways. Um, So we should all be concerned when whatever process leads to that result because uh, research shows juries have enjoy less legitimacy when they're less diverse. It's just, you know, it may be common for uh, minorities to be underrepresented on juries, but it doesn't. It isn't a good look when we're looking for legitimacy. So, in this case, as in every case, it's unfortunate that that's the phrase that the newspaper picks up and notices because it undercuts the legitimacy of the jury. But the juror said that there was one Hispanic man on the jury. She said this is part of why she wanted to speak to me, because it wasn't an all-white jury. I just got tired of people painting the jury as a racist, redneck group of uneducated people that, you know, had something out for someone that wasn't like them. And I'm tired of it. And I'm tired of, you know, these hardworking, moral people being villainized as, um, you know, something that we were not. But there still weren't any black people on the jury deciding Rodney's fate. Even though a juror's race should have no effect on whether or not they're selected to serve on a jury, race still impacted this trial. Here's Mary Rose again. So this is an area of juries and jury selection that race is all over, particularly when a case involves a black defendant and a white victim. It's just every kind of worst practice comes out in those kinds of cases, Um, particularly race-based decision-making, tendency to have an all-white jury, um, tendency to have a conviction-prone jury, uh, and and the jury feeling a lot of pressure uh, to produce one particular result and not another. Um, It doesn't mean that, that they're letting that interfere with them, but you know they feel it, particularly in a small town. After the trial ended, the juror was terrified. It had been an open courtroom, and word spread fast. Once people saw her sitting in the jury box, she was known across town as a member of that jury. Reactions were divided. Some people would seek her out to shake her hand, to tell her thank you. Others would hurl insults or cross to the other side of the road when she was walking by. You know, various things happened to me over that period of time. Uh, I would be surrounded at HEB and blocked off in an aisle by people, you know, who wouldn't let me pass. Um, I had to kind of bust through and run away a couple of times. Um, Someone ran into our gate and bashed our gate at our property. You know, is that a coincidence? I don't, you know, probably not. Um, You know, enough to put the sheriff on extra patrols at our house and, I think we had one, you know, kind of stationed outside of our property for a little while during the heat of it. So, you know, there was a there was a lot of intimidation. There was a lot of um, the feeling that you were hated, that you were literally hated for for doing something that you didn't really want to do in the first place that you were called to do. That was your civil duty. Um, you you could really feel the hatred. You know, it it was unnerving. Um, and of course, I've received phone calls and texts and messages over the years, you know, just never letting you forget. The whole process was, you know, very, very difficult. Um, My mom would say that it ruined my life. I think that's a little dramatic, but it definitely changed my life. Um, I was never the same after this trial. You know, I I think going home every day with the things, uh, gruesome, horrible, you know, things that I see saw and heard were you know it it was very difficult to do it was you had to kind of keep it all in 
And that in and of itself was, was very hard to do. Um, you know, I feel like I probably internalized most of it at the time. But, you know, I've spent probably the majority of my life, you know, with residual living in fear from this. I mean, it's really affected me greatly. And I, I don't know about other jurors. I've never spoken to them again. But I feel like you can't go through this and come away unchanged. It's impossible. Mary Rose said this is a common reaction for jurors. And, and even when I was in graduate school, there was a recognition of something called juror stress and, you know, a need to debrief um, when cases involve gruesome evidence, when cases involve, you know, week after week and intensive and high profile situations when jurors are scared because they're judging someone who's a gang member or mafia member or someone who they fear retaliation from. Just even if they're in a civil case and deciding on billions of dollars in potential damages. It's very stressful. And so courts are doing more to try to debrief with people after the fact. I will say that one of the advantages of the American system is that we have the First Amendment. After you're finished with jury service, you can talk about it all day long. But talking about her experience was painful. She told me her husband even tried to talk her out of our interview. I feel like I have lived a little bit in fear my whole life. Um, fear of something like that happening to some to myself or someone I loved because just hearing it over and over and over again. I mean, what if that was me at the stop sign, you know, on my way to the gym or coming home from, you know, rehearsal at the Bastrop, you know, opera house or something, you know, what if, you know, something like that happened and it, you know, it frightened me. And then of course, thinking about, you know, that it really brought it home to me and also like having children and, you know, what could something like that happen to them? And I even now have trouble staying by myself. <laughs> you know, I, um, I, it's an irrational fear, I know. Um, but, you know, coming face to face with evil, feeling like you were hated, feeling like people were out to get you or wanted to see you harmed because of this case. Um, feeling like it's still going on and it's still a part of, a large part of, you know, our now Texas history. Mary Rose said she really worries about jurors in cases like Rodney's. They're, the cases are intense. During the trial, um, there's going to be pressure in a small town and in any town to, to get it right in the sense of not let a killer go free. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure on that. But the sad fact about death penalty cases is there's a lot of error in them, which means chances are this case is going to get appealed. Chances are we're going to find error. Chances are some other jury is going to have to go through it again. And the newspaper is going to be covering it the way they're covering this case to, to leave open the possibility that that original jury really got it wrong. It's been 25 years since that original trial. Many people still point to Jimmy as Stacy's killer, but many think the right man is in jail. There are Facebook groups dedicated to maintaining Rodney's innocence and groups dedicated to maintaining his guilt. 11 years after Stacy's death, Jimmy was serving as an officer with the police department in Georgetown, Texas, a town right outside of Austin. He was called to handle a domestic disturbance case one day, when reports say that he drove the 20-year-old woman who made the call to an empty park. Jordan Smith told me what happened in that case. After Jimmy's working for the Georgetown Police Department, um, he is accused and ends up pleading guilty and going to prison for 10 years for sexually assaulting, for kidnapping and sexually assaulting a woman while he's on duty, while he's in uniform, raping her uh, was after he put his gun next to her head and then basically threatened her and said, hey, if you tell anybody, I'll come kill you. He served 10 years in prison. And in 2010, during his prison sentence, a fellow inmate submitted an affidavit. It reported a conversation between the men 
where Jimmy confessed that he had to kill Stacy because she was sleeping with a black man. But more importantly is that, you know, there are several people who, as I mentioned before, there were several people who told the cops back in 97 and 96 that, you know, they knew that Rodney and Stacy knew each other. And they knew that Stacy was a, like, you know, that this was not a good relationship that she and Fennell were in. And they essentially suppressed that information. They never made it public. So they like lied in court essentially and withheld information that would have been crucial to the defense and also would have, you know, not allowed them to argue in court so bombastically that they had done such, you know, heroic work and this was the only possible solution that, you know, Rodney had killed Stacy. I think, you know, this should shouldn't come as too much of a surprise <laughs> that people were definitely wary of this whole, you know, scenario um, in speaking out against Fennell. I mean, there were people who worked in law enforcement in Bastrop County who have subsequently said that there were things that happened and things that they heard basically out of Fennell's mouth um, that were really disturbing, but that they hadn't come forward because they were afraid to. They still had family that lived in the area and they didn't want them to be targets, you know? And it's kind of, you know, that's like, if you think about it for more than a second, it's not terribly surprising, right? Like it's it's sort of a fraught situation. Um, and certainly if you were a member of, of the minority community, you would have, you know, real reason to be wary about coming forward. Um, you know, to to speak poorly of a poor of a uh, of a white police officer, and to suggest that you know maybe he had some involvement in his fiance's death. So I don't, you know, this whole notion that all oh, these people aren't credible because they didn't come forward is just not. I don't think that holds water when you consider like sort of the scenario and what people would have had to do to to say what they knew, you know, and then also, I mean, would it even have made a difference? I mean, we know, again, we know that people came forward and did tell them and they didn't do anything with it. They just withheld it and suppressed that information for, you know, 20, more than 20 years. Um, They've had information in their files that Stacy and Rodney knew each other and that they were very flirty and that Fennell was, you know, an ass. So you know, they didn't do anything with it. So I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't blame people for not wanting to stick their necks out in some way. I, I can understand it. I mean, I wish they would have, but but I can understand why in some cases they wouldn't have. The juror said that the news about Jimmy still didn't make her change her mind about her original decision. She even went back to the evidence that was presented at the trial. She talked to her parents, and she thought of Rodney's other alleged victims. There's nothing else to be said. These, you know, he created, he did these crimes. Um, He was indicted on these crimes, and that... You know, evil was stopped and justice was served. It's, you have to come back to it. I mean, it's, you have to come back to the facts that, you know, it doesn't matter what another person did years later. It is about what happened at the time. Appeals don't have a very high rate of success in death row conviction cases. But Rodney's time was ticking and his family, lawyers, and supporters rallied behind him. The Innocence Project is a nonprofit organization that provides legal counsel and advocacy for incarcerated people who they believe have been wrongly convicted. They picked up Rodney's case in 2012, and they knew that if they were going to try to get him out of there, they had to take every possible road. There have been nine total appeals over the past 25 years, That's a lot of back and forth, and a lot of paperwork. I'm going to try to summarize a few of the biggest pieces of new evidence that have come forward and led to those appeals. After enough new witness testimonies were collected, there was an evidentiary hearing in 2017, basically where Rodney's lawyers presented any new evidence that they'd found to a court. A forensic pathologist named Dr. Michael Bodden was called to testify. He has a career of investigating high-profile murders, like JFK and Dr. Martin Luther King, 
and more recently, George Floyd. He re-examined the crime scene photos of Stacy's body, and he specifically looked at how her blood settled in her skin, which is called her lividity. Based on the evidence, he said Stacy died sometime before midnight, not at 3 a.m. like Bayardo had originally testified. This would have placed Stacy in her apartment with Jimmy at the time of her death. Bodden also told the court that he disagreed with the original team of investigators, that he didn't think Stacy was sexually assaulted before her death. But even as the appeals kept coming, Rodney remained in his cell on death row. And since the beginning, he and his supporters have maintained his innocence. One of these supporters is Julie Strickland, who became friends with Rodney when they were teenagers. She now runs a Facebook page dedicated to Rodney's release. It's called Rodney Reed Innocent on Texas Death Row. She lives in Florida with her partner now, but she makes the 14-hour drive to Texas every few months to visit Rodney in prison. She said he's a close friend. You know, we talk about it some, the case some, but honestly, a lot of, most of the time when we're visiting, we really just talk about the world about what's going on in the world, about um, the climate, you know, just, we just talk about stuff. He asks about my brothers and my mom, and he tells me about, you know, things that he's heard about his kids or his grandkids. And so we don't really spend a whole lot of time talking about the case. She told me that one of Rodney's friends regularly prints out colored photographs of his children and grandchildren and sends them to Rodney. Last time Julie visited him, Rodney talked to her about what each one of them were up to. It's been 25 years, but those two months in the spring of 1998 are burned into the juror's mind. She left Texas for several years, looking to start fresh. But eventually, she realized that she couldn't move on entirely, and that what happened changed her. Every couple of months, she'll Google what's currently happening with the case. One day, she even took an elevator down to the records room in the Texas Capitol and looked at the case files herself. I mean, I I didn't live here in Texas for many years. Um, My mom says I moved to get away from this. There may be truth to that. Um... But I will check up on it and see what the latest is. And you know what? This is America, and he has every right to appeal. He has every right to, you know, pro- to the due process of our law and, and, what, and what we allow people to do. I mean, he has every right to do that. And he's obviously, his, you know, his team is taking advantage of that. Um, I feel like I, as long as he is here, I live in fear you know, of of retaliation. And I don't know if that will go away, if he is ever executed, or if his family will live on, you know, to cause some kind of retribution um, for what we did for our sentencing. Mary Rose said she understands how much pressure the jury in Rodney's case was under, and she feels sympathy for them. You saw that happen in the Boston Marathon case. You saw it in other cases where there's a mix of opinion about whether it's a good thing to have a death penalty pursued because it's so hard to get it finalized, right? And that's because so many mistakes get made. So I can only express just so much sympathy and sadness for a juror who it was a hard experience to begin with. It was a hard decision to make, whether it was an all-white jury or a mixed race jury or, you know, nobody takes that decision lightly, right? And so they already had it hard. Then it comes back up. Then there's a lot of questions about whether they got it wrong. And the reality is the mistakes I'm hearing about that case is information that would have been useful to them was withheld. So that's going to make you crazy upset about how would I have heard that information and wonder. And so I just think it's understandable to me that there's a lot of suffering from this. And it's another reason why I'm not sure that we should be putting these cases in front of people, any person. Um, But be that as it may, 
you know, I hope she can find peace with the fact that, you know, they did their duty. They did what they thought was right. They responded to the evidence that they had. But I, I can only imagine the second guessing that that whole group is doing. Rodney was originally scheduled to be executed in 2015. His attorneys were able to delay it after they appealed based upon the medical examiner Bayardo recanting his testimony about the sperm DNA. Rodney's team of lawyers also requested more advanced DNA testing for various swabs that were done across Stacy's body. The reports came back showing Rodney's DNA had matched up for every one of these swabs. After four more years on death row, Rodney was notified that he had a new execution date, November of 2019. This was when his case started blowing up. It was all over the internet, social media, and on TV, with celebrities like Rihanna and Kim Kardashian even chiming in. This morning, reality star Kim Kardashian West is calling on Governor Greg Abbott to, quote, do the right thing in the case of Bastrop death row inmate Rodney Reed. Car- Numerous Dash Texas West lawmakers started appealing to the Texas governor, Greg Abbott himself, asking him to halt the execution. A month before Rodney's execution date, the television show host Dr. Phil released a two-part segment that featured him interviewing Rodney through the plexiglass on death row. A Dr. Phil interview like you've never seen before. Did you rape and murder Stacey Stites? No, I absolutely did not. From death row. So Rodney's lawyers filed a new writ of habeas corpus a request that asked the court to consider the new evidence and vacate Rodney's sentence. The new evidence was four new witness statements. In the past 20 years, more witnesses have emerged that say they knew about the alleged affair between Rodney and Stacy. Some have also signed affidavits about the tumultuous nature of Jimmy and Stacy's relationship. One of these came from Rebecca Peoples who was 16 years old at the time she worked with Stacy at HEB. She said that Stacy told her that she was afraid of Jimmy and that she was having an affair with a black man. Rebecca told the Innocence Project that at the time, she was scared to speak out and receive backlash from the people in Bastrop. A former Bastrop County Sheriff's deputy also submitted an affidavit. He said that back in 1996, Stacy's co-workers at HEB told him that they would warn Stacy when Jimmy arrived at the store so that she could try to hide, because she thought that he would start arguing with her in public. Rodney's legal team used these witnesses to push that there was enough evidence to warrant a new trial. The prosecution said these witnesses weren't credible, though. But five days before Rodney's 2019 execution date, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals ordered a stay of execution. They sent the case with its new information and witnesses, and the defense's claim that Rodney was innocent, back down for the lower courts to review. Then, two years later, there was another 10-day evidentiary hearing. This time, a Texas judge ruled that the new evidence was not enough to give Rodney a new trial. Throughout every year and every appeal, Rodney's family continued to fight. They started a movement called the Reed Justice Initiative, and Rodney's brother, Roderick, still regularly speaks at panels, protests, and rallies. Still, after nine failed appeals, their spirits must have been low. But what Rodney's lawyers kept coming back to was one gaping hole in the case's DNA testing. The murder weapon. Stacy's brown leather belt. It's what left the deep purple marks on her neck. And it had never been tested for DNA. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals had previously rejected Rodney's appeal for court-ordered DNA testing of the belt. So in the summer of 2022... Rodney's lawyers hired Chase Baumgartner as their forensic scientist to write an amicus brief to the Supreme Court, who agreed to hear the case. This is broadly, an amicus brief is translated to a friend of the court. It's a brief you file on someone's behalf, but really to help inform the court of 
an issue. They argued that the belt could have the killer's DNA on it. During the original trial, pieces of evidence were kept in a brown cardboard box and passed around the courtroom. One photo I saw showed the belt sitting on top of pieces of Stacy's clothes, without any protective coverings or separations. Dozens of people touched the belt without wearing gloves that day, including the lawyers and members of the jury. The Texas Code of Criminal Procedure requires that all biological evidence in a capital case must be preserved until an inmate is executed, dies, or is released on parole. And they define biological evidence as either the contents of a sexual assault examination kit or, quote, any item that contains blood, semen, hair, saliva, skin tissue, fingernail scrapings, bone, bodily fluids, or pretty much any collected biological material. It's hard to know if the court at the original trial in 1998 would have considered the belt a piece of biological evidence. But a presentation from the Texas Department of Public Safety features a slide with the title Examples of Biological Evidence. And one of these examples reads, quote, ligatures such as ropes, belts, tape, and cords. If evidence isn't handled with the proper precautions in court, or even before then, its DNA evidence is likely to become contaminated. And it's happened before. In one trial that the presentation mentions, an attorney's DNA ended up on one of the pieces of evidence. So, the original court might not have known this guidance at the time, or they chose not to follow it. But, Chase says that the potential for contamination should not rule out DNA testing. So I was trying to explain to the court that just because it may be contaminated, we shouldn't prevent DNA testing on on the belt because of that, because if that is the threshold to prevent DNA testing, we'll never DNA test anything because from, from, from a lab standpoint, everything that comes in has that potential to be contaminated. You won't know till you test it and develop a DNA profile. In April of 2023, a news alert popped up on my phone's lock screen. The Supreme Court had made their decision in Rodney's case months earlier than anyone expected. It was good news for Rodney's supporters. His case was moving back down to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, where they would make a final decision on if the belt would be DNA tested. The prosecution said that the murder weapon had been improperly stored and that it was probably contaminated. And they initially claimed that Rodney and his team had waited too long to fight against the court's original decision not to allow DNA testing on the belt, which happened back in 2014. They said that if Rodney's team wanted to challenge the state with the civil rights suit, they should have done it within two years of that first denial, which is Texas law. But in a six to three ruling, the Supreme Court agreed with Rodney's team and said that the two year deadline doesn't start until after all of the state proceedings end. The Fifth Circuit could easily say that the belt won't be tested. Rodney has already lost an appeal in the Fifth Circuit once. It could happen again. We don't know when they'll hear the case. And until then, Rodney's still on death row, with no current execution date scheduled. As of now, Rodney Reed is one of 82 Black inmates on death row in Texas. That's nearly half of the total population of death row inmates. Even though Black people only make up 12% of Texas's total population. The 82 Black inmates is almost twice the number of white inmates in Texas, which stands at 46. In the entire United States, Texas has the most active execution chamber. As of mid-February 2024, the state of Texas has executed 586 people since 1982. That number will be 588 in less than a month. There's another execution scheduled for late February, and one more in March. Last year, Texas executed eight men. Three of them were Black. Sixteen people have been wrongfully convicted of the death penalty and later released. 
But there's evidence that suggests Texas has actually killed innocent people, too. Here's Mary Rose again. The evidence is not good, including in Texas, that it, we give this sentence accurately. Because if retribution means anything, it means getting the right person. So I would say that the key factors in a just system is somebody gets what they deserve, right? And I think intuitively, Texans and lots of people in the United States feel like if you take a life, then you deserve to give up your life. And it, it stated that way. I wouldn't say it's hard to argue with because I'm sure there are people who would argue with it for religious or other reasons, but it's not a crazy thought, right? You know, and if someone hurt my child, I'm sure that's how I would feel. So um, it it has a kind of superficial retributive quality, and social science shows that most people are motivated by retribution, not revenge, but just the idea of matching the punishment to the crime, that basic idea. It's as old as the Bible and beyond. And so there is, it's totally understandable that people might think this is a punishment that you need in order to match the seriousness of the offense. Despite the appeals, despite the changes, I don't want to end without expressing my sorrow for how this case has torn families apart. A beautiful, young, and precious life was taken. And countless others have been changed forever, every day since that Tuesday in April 1996. When I first started reporting on this case, one of my producers asked the question, what is justice? It's a question that I've thought a lot about over the past year. The purpose of these episodes isn't to convince you whether Rodney or Jimmy is guilty or innocent. It's not to convince you whether or not Rodney's a criminal. And as you heard, he had a criminal record before Stacy's murder. But one thing that's become clear to me is that he's still a person. One that's been sitting in solitary confinement for over two decades. And then there's Stacy. She was a person too one who is still deeply loved by her friends and her family. Her story and her name often gets buried in the media frenzy that Rodney's case has become. She deserved better than what she got. She still deserves justice, and so does her family. And if there's even a slight chance that Rodney didn't kill her, what does it say about us as a state? as a country, as a society, that we don't do what we can to make sure the right person is held responsible for her death. What is justice? I've learned a lot about my own answer to that question. When I first started working on this story, I really hadn't thought a whole lot about the death penalty. I mildly disagreed with it, but it wasn't something that I deeply considered. Now, after reporting on this story for a year, I can't find a single thing about our country's system of capital punishment that I can stand behind. It's not something that makes me proud to be a Texan or proud to be an American. As Mary Rose told me, you just can't look at the data and Mm -hmm. think this is a defensible system. You can form your own opinion. And if you do, I hope you consider the nuances, the doubts, the risks. Again, I'm not here to change your mind one way or the other, but I want to challenge you to try to answer this question for yourself. What is justice? In part three of this series, I'm going to introduce you to a man who was sent to Texas death row a few years before Rodney, but his story ended much differently. This episode is reported, written, and hosted by Aisling Ayers. I'm Katie Pichagautka, and I'm the executive producer. The associate producers for this episode are Cameron Greiser and Mackenzie Matwick. 
Our cover art was created by Alexa Georgelos. Sophia Vargas Karam is the Drag's marketing and communications manager. Our executive producers are Heather Stewart and Lainey Steinhardt. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all of her support and guidance. This podcast is presented by the Drag Audio Production House, which is a part of Texas student media at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. This podcast was funded in part thanks to support from Arnold Ventures. Special thanks to the University of Texas School of Journalism and Media and Texas Student Media. Also to Robert Quigley, Rachel Davis Mercy, Kathleen McElroy, and Gerald Johnson. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by individual donations. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com/donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students an amazing educational experience. Thanks for listening.